mixing royalty in the house. It's ho, 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 we, your hip hop version. Get that out of your heads. Welcome to Pensado's Place. Let's roll it, Will. Notice anything different? No. What, what changed? I didn't say, yay. Oh, man. Is this a New Year resolution? I don't make resolutions. It's, it, but it's a commitment? No, just, you know, we're approaching a new year. We've done 40-something episodes. We've you're, you're growing. You're growing. Yeah, I mean, we're going to change some stuff, cool. you know. Cool. That's yep. a significant change. For, for, so for 2012, we will not have, that the big change in the show is we will not do yay right after Michael. Yeah. <laughs> Unless there's an overwhelming groundswell from the critics. That's true. You know, the critics, we're their darling. That's true. And, and so we, we, you know, all the reviews have just been spectacular. Particularly on the yays. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I don't even remember. I, I don't even, I think, I think the, the tension of the very first show, the, the pressure and the tension and not knowing if I could do this and if anybody would care, I think it snuck out kind of accidentally and then... And locked in. Oh. And I liked it, so I kept doing it. I'm, 50 I'm, weeks later, here we are. How are you, man? Oh, man, everything's great. Uh, I had a good week on the, on the mix tip. And got a great guest in this week, for sure. Oh, yeah, Dave... Uh, uh, I love having guests, and I try to pick guests for the show that do things I can't do, and Dave does things I just no way I could do what he does. He's and incredible. Just for our audience to make it clear, you're not talking about yourself. You're talking about No, I'm guests. talking about Dave Aaron. There you we'll, go. we'll get to that in a minute. I'm saving that. Absolutely. Well, let's do what we usually do, which is get our homework done. You know where to contact us, and you'll see it up on the screen. There it is. Facebook, Twitter, our YouTube channel. Um, you guys have been great and supportive, and boy, 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 we certainly appreciate it. So make sure you get to us, and I think without further ado, Dave, let's get right to uh, an ITL. Okay, uh, I think you can enjoy this week's ITL. I know, I think I certainly will. <laughs> I'm being stupid. Uh, what is new? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, you'll enjoy this week's ITL, I hope, if you'll run it, Will. Okay, I trust everybody's having a good holiday. Um, I'm going to call this episode "Dynamics Are Your Friend," and uh, you're going to reach a point in this, uh, in this episode of Into the Lair where you're going to go, "Well, Dave, you did EQ. How can that be dynamics?" Well, we're going to we're going to play with the dynamics on the EQ too. Uh, what I want to do today is show you that there's nothing sacred in in mixing. Uh, the stereo bus is looked at with some kind of mystery and awe. <clears throat> I know because I used to do that. Still do sometimes. But when we have programmed drums, and even, even drummers are so good nowadays, um, the dynamics of, of the drums tend to not change a lot. And then with uh, compression or whatever, uh, dynamics are, are, are getting lost a little bit. So what I wanted to show you was how I, uh, uh, how I overcome this. So uh, what I want to show you is how uh, is different ways I do that. Uh, but as always, there's a bigger picture here. I want you to think of different ways to use some of these techniques. Now, philosophically, one of the reasons that we like programmed drums is because they can become hypnotic. But there's a very fine line between hypnotic and monotonous. So um, this is my friend's monster block. Incredible track. I'm just gonna play the track. Now I'm gonna go from the verse to the chorus. I want you to see what happens. I'm gonna play you a couple of bars of the verse, a couple of bars of the chorus. Okay, that was one bar. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, guys, is I'm gonna play you two bars of the verse going into the hook. Watch the, listen to it. The drum stayed the same. Everything stayed the same. So let's do this. Let's just take our, our master fader and turn it up a dB. Okay, that was a hair more. Now, now watch what happens. Okay, now coming out, going back into the verse. Y 
you have to struggle to hear it, but you definitely feel it, right? You feel it, right, Will? It's like it just gives you that little lift that, that, that you need to go into the chorus and then drop the dynamics or the energy back down. Another thing we can do, let's, let's take that off for a second. Another thing we can do is manipulate individual tracks. Okay, guys, so what I've done is I've, I've taken uh, my, my, my uh, DSP plug-in, and if you'll notice, I've, I've got it automated. This is my automation right here. Uh, I'm bringing in 9 dB of 4K, um, way too much, but I just want you to hear it. So check this out. Here's our kick normally. It gets a little brighter, right? Okay, now let's put that in the track and see what we've got. Okay, we get a little bit of a lift. Uh, now, it's too much, but think about doing that, something similar to the snare, something similar to other parts. I'm going to show you, uh, there's a real important kind of open hi-hat and um, I'm going to show you what, what we can do with that. Here's the hi-hat normal. Okay, when it gets to right here, notice that, um, that this plug-in comes on and we're adding 1.7 at 10k. I'll exaggerate it. Okay, now let's put that in the track. Let's go from our verse to our chorus. Cool. Now, another thing we can do is we can come up here to our auxes. You can put all your music through an aux. And uh, here's, here's all of my music right here, this, this music aux right here, third red one. Now, here's my, here's my verse, it's 16 bars. So let's do this, let's, let's drop the level down. Let's see, we're starting at two, let's drop the level down about that much. And then right here, Let's give ourselves a little boost at, at the midpoint in the verse. So let's watch this. Now, if we had if we had combined that with our with our global move here, watch this coming out of the verse. Okay, not earth shattering, but uh, it might sell four or five more records, but. That's okay. It's it's uh, what I'm trying to show you is don't be afraid to to to, to use your creativity, to use um, your taste, and and to try and dig back and remember the things that that help get those juices flowing when you heard a really cool song, and and on on a lot of the songs that were performed uh, live uh, by by players instead of programming. Uh, what you're trying to do is recreate some of those dynamics within the framework of what we've got to work with now. Everything that I've shown you is probably a little bit more 
over the top than it needs to be, but I, I wanted you to be able to hear the, the difference. So you probably want to do it a little more subtle, but maybe not, you know, in a dance, a dance track or, or a hip hop track, something like that. You can, you can be a little more um, uh, over the top with these techniques. And as usual, if you think something better than me, fire it over here. I want to hear it. All right, guys. Have a nice holiday. Okay, guys. Um, today's guest is Dave Aaron. I've known Dave for, Dave for a minute and always respected what he's done. If you've, if you've been asleep for the last 20 years, Dave, uh, Dave did the two, uh, the really cool Tupac records. He, uh, he engineered them, he mixed them. Um, Snoop, he's, he's done the, uh, tons of stuff with Snoop and has been doing Snoop's live shows uh, front of house uh, since about 95 or 96. Wow. We'll find that out in a second. Uh, he did Sublime. Uh, I forget the name of that record, but we'll talk to him about that. Great record. Uh, Wu-Tang, Prince. Um, he's currently working on some stuff with J-Lo. Perry Farrell. Mm. Um, um, Dr. Dre, U2. Anyway, I mean the guys. The guys got spectacular credits. I'm, I'm, and these credits aren't like kind of fake credits. These are like the real records, the great records that a lot of these guys have done. Welcome. And I'm so happy to have him on the show. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you, Dave. Thanks for having me, Dave. And uh, Dave and I, uh, we've been friends for about the years. And Dave, Dave assisted for me for a couple of years. And those were some of the most fun times in my entire career. Everything seemed new and fresh, and I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Dave knew more than I knew, and uh, it was just a good time, wasn't it, Dave? It was, it was. I'm not sure I knew more then than you did, though. That that was an awesome time. I yeah. loved being, uh, you know, under you learning everything. I think you've turned out some pretty good assistance, too, from that time. Oh, thanks. There's been a lot thanks. of people that have done well. How, you, you, know. you, you had just come from Memphis, right? Yeah, I'd moved out here from Memphis. And uh, I, where I, I was working at Sun Studio, and then uh, you know I think that gave me a real handle on how to do a lot of live stuff, how to treat like B3 organs and mm -hmm. horns and things like that, you know. So I brought that out. Pay for that. You know what I mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. it was old school. Plus, he grew up and he grew up in like 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 I don't know, coming from the South, you know, growing up in, in South Florida, uh, it just seemed like. Everything was cooler in New York and New Jersey, and if you talk about the coolest spot in New Jersey, it has to be Asbury Park. That's, right. that's where he's from. Oh, no joke. You yeah. know, yeah. Asbury Park, New what Jersey. A pedigree. Yeah, it was good. You know, everybody. You know, we were big Bruce Springsteen fans, sure. and you know, of course, that all went down. But at the same time, it was a it was a big black community there. It's like like predominantly, oh, and I so no yeah, it's really really strong and. And where I went to school, it was like that too. So it really prepared me actually for my rap career and yeah. things in hip hop because I didn't know that was to wow. come. But wow. I, you know, it really did. So yeah, yeah and then that. and then uh, we'll we'll get to the cool stuff. But another biographical interesting thing is Dave's dad was a, a well-known bebop trumpet player. Oh, good job. Yeah, he played up with New York. He wow. was a, yeah. He, he used to jam a lot. Miles. Yeah, that influenced what you listened to when you were coming up as a kid. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah cool. that definitely did. For sure. You know, and I think that's how I, I still do jazz stuff now. Mm -hmm. You know, I do we do jazz fusion stuff. Mm -hmm. I had somebody. Uh, I had uh, per, uh, Steve Perkins from James Addiction. Wow. And when this guy Willie Waldman is a trumpet player, they, we have a group that we have together, Banyan, and uh, it includes a lot of big big host of, of all stars. Oh cool. And they just come in and we improv everything and jam it out and you know I'll record it and mix it, even play some clarinet on it. Oh and, nice. Yeah, and it, it, it's really you know it's good to express yourself that way because we do a lot of, of commercial music so much mm -hmm. and everything is a little more formulated and mm -hmm. you have to kind of stay within Think a certain numbers. box yeah. and this and that and, and just to be able to open up and express yourself like that and mm -hmm. just kind of do what comes naturally with music, it's it's it was a real treat. Can yeah. people find the band? Stuff or? They, there's a there's a few albums out anytime at all we did a few years ago and we're doing the new one now okay. over at the at the studio and actually it was a really great thing because I I just opened the studio and it was a good time for us to uh, to to test everything sure. out sure. we had everyone play all at the same time nice. from piano in the piano room to drums bass in the uh, in the live room. Uh, and bass in the, I mean, in the control room. We had the guitar player in the control room, and uh, we had like the whole thing maxed out. 
and it was good to see it all work, you know, because oh, that was like our first time to really Don't do all think, that. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm so fascinated by it. I find that some of the guests that we've had on, and due to Dave's Rolodex, we've just had incredible people sit in this chair, like yourself. Um, and one of the prevailing themes that, that kind of runs through it all is that you learn these lessons from doing some of this old school stuff mm -hmm. that then apply in what you do today, yeah. and that you'll be better for doing that. Do, the you, music do you agree? Be better. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. you're, you're putting a lot of that musicality into the music, which is, you know, a lot of times I think you might hear a song that you think is lacking that musicality. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, guys like Dave, who are musical guys, mm -hmm. who have brought up with a big musical background like I did. Um, you know, I think it, it, it for sure adds to the music and adds to your experience. And, you, you know, you not that a, you, I'm putting jazz stuff in, no, hip hop no. stuff, but you are going to draw from that and, right. and you're going to do things that are a little more, you know, subtly cool in certain ways that people might just get it. Right. One of the interesting things that, um, that I like about the hip hop world, a, a lot of the lyrics I don't understand. I don't. I didn't grow up in, in a lot of the same situations as a lot of my friends, so some of that I don't understand. I try to. But one of the neat things about the elements of hip-hop that I do understand is that it's incredibly rare that a, an artist that we work with will say, you can't do that. This is a rap record. It's like, it's like the most open, any idea, anything. And so the step from jazz to hip-hop is a very tiny step because, I mean, uh, uh, us three, Cantaloupe, uh, Diggable Planets. I mean, there's always been a, a in the early part of hip hop. There's always been a strong jazz influence, and, and like that. it's really improvisational, and you know the way mm. people freestyle mm. and everything like that. I mean, it's that's total jazz. It's, it's style, total. You know, this is total point. jazz improvisational. Yeah, yeah. And even we, in the studio, everything's not so planned out like it I is know. on certain songs. You know, pop songs or rock songs. Like you go in there with an idea and a, and a beat. Mm. But during there, you're doing all your overdubs mm -hmm. on the fly from what you're hearing. You're writing verses. You're doing things that are yeah, like you actually are, you, stem from he, you know hearing mm -hmm. the music and being you know fed off of that. You worked with of Tupac like I, uh, I worked with Tupac. I've never seen anybody improvise like Tupac did. I mean, he yeah. was he was like all improvisation. He was amazing. He would come into the studio. He might have a, a hook or something, you know, and he'll just I mean immediately. He doesn't even say hi, he would just say, is the mic up? Yeah, he'd walk right in. I'd start recording from the headphones all the way on, just all of it, you know? Wow. And uh, Plus, he, then he the, would just, you know, he would just do his hook and write his verses and mm -hmm. just write I, the, I tell people this, people don't believe me. He would write the song at, at that moment and then you back the tape up and he'd double it and rarely would you have to like punch him in. Oh, wow. His doubles were like... He, he, would, he would say, run the tape down and I would run it from top, after he recorded a hook, he'd, he'd run it, let me do the verse. I'd run it from top to bottom. By the time the tape got from the top to the bottom, he it was ready to go in the booth. Wow. So it was just one time down. Wow. Basically, like five minutes, if that. Yeah. He was... He's verse. Yeah. Well, unbelievable. What was it like being part of Death Row in the early days? Did you, did you know you were part of something unique and special? I, I, I knew it was kind of cool. I knew it was cool because, you know, no one... There was a lot of people that didn't want to work on it. They were, they were a little scared of it. They were a little... They didn't know how to Plus, there was it. a prejudice against it I in the music industry. there was a prejudice industry. against it. There was, a lot of engineers considered it not the, not the premier gig. Yeah, that's true. And, and I thought I saw that as an opportunity. I'm like, mm -hmm. good, because I needed to work, <laughs> and no one wanted this gig and that I could obviously see had potential mm -hmm. of being something that people would look back and say, "Wow, I wish I had done hip hop," mm -hmm. you know, because it became so big. But I know, you know, it was the same way when, you know, people used to say, you know, don't listen to Led Zeppelin's devil music and mm -hmm. you know stuff like that. But now it's so accepted. Yeah. And when you, it was the same thing with the rap. It was like I get people's parents to go, oh, that's good, you're working, but maybe you can work on some different things and this and that. And that's when I knew. I said, oh, oh the yeah. parents don't like it. I'm on to something oh, special. So when I was, yeah, when I, was, I knew it was something When big. I was starting my career in Atlanta, um, I did a lot of hip hop and rap, not because I could, but because nobody else would. And, and yes. had it not been for the hip hop community, it, it would have. I, I might still not have. Got a foothold with my career, you know, but it was it was just it was fresh and new. But it, again, I like I said when I grew up in Asbury Park and I went to the high school with, you know, it was it was it was more like lean on me than you know <laughs> any kind of high school experience, you know what yeah. I mean? So it was it was a tough type of upbringing, and yeah. 
I think I was just used to it. When I got there, I was like, what's the big deal? It's like, this is just like being in high school. It's like you deal with a couple jokers, you, yeah. you know, a couple guys it's, test it's you, you, you pass the test, there's no big deal, you move on through and it's nothing. Right. And I, I think that really helped me, you know. I, I was definitely placed in the right situation at that time. Did, did that time period inform later things that weren't in that genre as well? What you learned from there? Oh, yeah. To well, even what I learned for Prince, I transferred into what I learned doing the death row stuff. Like after working with Prince, and he was so particular and so he needed everything right now and correct, and he wasn't playing, you know, and very demanding. And you know, after you work with somebody like that, you know, then you could easily work with Tupac. He yeah. was the same way, demanding, expected things yeah. quickly. Now this and that, but you know, I'm trained for that already now. Yeah. So yeah. by the time I got to him, I was ready. It was like, yeah, this is nothing. This is easy, you know. Mm. And that's why we kind of got along really good together. Mm. And. Uh, you know, the same with the other guys. And uh, yeah, I still do today use all the, the, the influences that I had from the music into the music yeah. I'm doing now. Well, that's what's exciting to me about, sure. the, about the music Even now. if I do rock or I do yeah, anything, precisely. anything, yeah, or even the jazz stuff, it's mm -hmm. got to have still that that solid, that I want that low solid thing that's happening. It doesn't have to be overbearing. I'm not going to make it where it's like, oh wow, it's too much bass for a jazz. I'm gonna say, but it just has to be warm yeah. and solid where I hear a lot of stuff that's not quite there. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of even rock records that are big, they just don't have quite that, the, the low end that mm -hmm. I kind of mm -hmm. typically like and the warmth maybe that I t typically would like. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard. When, when, when somebody says the phrase hip-hop mixing, uh, I, I'm still trying to figure yeah. out exactly what that is. And, and like, like, I need a hip-hop mix on this. I'm like, okay, sure, no trouble. Herb, charge them. Then, <laughs> then I go home and I'm like, what the hell's a hip-hop mix? Yeah. Uh, I think we do it, you and I both do a lot of hip-hop, and, and you've had that same thing. Yeah. Just, just for the sake of, of something to talk about on the show, when somebody says that, what's the first thing that comes to your mind as to what they want? I think, I always think of something that's gonna, that's gonna cut through, that you, especially if it's rap, you mm -hmm. want the vocal to be the main thing, just yeah, so you can paint the picture. You know, and without that, I mean, the the beat is just kind of going to be lonely there. So, <laughs> you know, you got to have that first off. And yeah. uh, if that vocal can cut through, and then you can get the subsonic frequencies with the drums and the bass and everything to line up so that they're not cluttering, and that it it has a nice tight sound. I think you know that's pretty much what I go for in a hip hop mix. I want everything to be sparse enough so that you can still focus on the things that you want to focus on, like the beat, like the vocals, and like some sporadic effects that I might throw through there too, you know? So, yeah. you know, I don't want to clutter it up with a, I'm not gonna put the same type of keyboard mix on a hip hop song that I would maybe on a pop song or something because the keyboards are gonna get in the way of a lot of things where I want yeah. it to be more, you know, more driving the beat and the vocal to be more dominant, so. I don't know. I think that's what I kind of go for with a hip hop mix. Yeah. Maybe just not so spartan. It's a philosophy rather than an engineering technique. A little bit. And, and I think that, you know, I especially used to go for my, a lot more drier sound too. I think that helps mm. in a hip hop style mix, I guess, in quotes. Mm. Although now, a lot of people are trying to do a lot more with effects and different things like that too, you know, make mm. their stuff a little more current with effects or a little more different than what it had been in the past, you know, mm -hmm. so. Um, I effects know. are like um, hairstyles and pants styles, they're, they're, they're trends, they're fads, and when you, when you and I first started, gosh, if, if you even walk near a reverb unit, people would like, did you walk near a reverb unit? I hear reverb somewhere, it's yeah. like, man, yeah, you just funny. couldn't, you couldn't even have the lights on, and now it's like, there's a lot of, a lot of wet yeah, mixes now, I, I but like you know what? The, the, I don't mean to cut you off, but the, um, it seems like like there's a new trend that's kind of counteracting a little bit of the softer hip hop, hip -hop stuff that's coming along. That's that's kind of making fun of that in a way. They're getting back hard and dry again. I, I, I think I don't know. Yeah, it, it gets. It, I think it goes back and forth with the dry sound and the effects and stuff. But I find that. Like I used to do a whole lot with with uh, 
with effects. When I was in college and this and that, you know, you're new to the game mm -hmm. and you want to do a bunch of effects on everything, mm -hmm. you know, and you want that to be, you know, that's just part of your sound. You want, yeah. I want to be effects yeah. guy, you know, but then, um, you know, when you start working in, in the real industry and you start to see what really works with the music you're working with and what people want, you know, I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't really go that route that much because I could see where it wasn't really going to work. But I always did like to do some signature effect sound, something that was going to make it where I, it was identifiable to my mix, kind of like I signed cool. it, Good. you know. So as far as do, using effects, even still today, I don't use effect all the way through the song on something like I might not use like a big hall reverb on a on a on a on a, on a rap vocal or something through the whole song unless you know I mean I totally unless I want that but I more put my effects in 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 places where I want them make them a special moment exactly mm -hmm. so I'll throw a delay in here I'll I'll make this little section distorted I'll, I'll, I'll drop the beat and make this sound, you know, certain ways. I mean, people are pitching it down now. You know, it's, it, there's a lot of different ways. It's hard to be brand new with things, but it's the way you approach it, oh, yeah. I think, that, that means the most, you know. You and, I, you and I have always heard music similarly in, in the sense that, that we've always liked uh, a, a big, fat bottom end. Mm -hmm. And um, there was two things that, that in my career that took me forever to to get a handle on. One was vocals and the other one was low end. And can you, your low end is spectacular. Can you impart some sense of wisdom to our audience about how to approach low end or what your approach to getting the low end is? A lot of people ask me, how do you keep the bass out of the way of the kick? How do you have an 808 and a bass that's thing? What, can you give us a little philosophy and a little uh, well, that's education the, that's down the there? That's hard to work with. Uh, if, if you just got a bass and a kick, then you're, you're just dealing with the two things. It's not that hard to really get that out of, but sometimes the Andy tracks, it's got 808s in it, a bass sound, a synth bass sound, a live bass sound, another kick, a lighter kick, and you've got all these things to deal with on the low end. You know, there you have to make choices, and you're going to have to decide, you know, where things are going to work, where you want that sub to come from, where you want the punch to come from, and you just kind of separate it out a little bit, and kind of work with it like a puzzle until you get it to just fit just right. When you say separate it out, would you, would you take, a, would you roll some low end off of a, a synth bass, for example? Many times I roll low end off of something to actually get more bass out of it. Ooh. To tell you the truth, it sounds weird, but there's so much stuff that you don't need sometimes, and it's just kind of muddling up everything underneath. And if I, I find if I just filter a lot of that out with a high pass filter, I can turn up the bass sound more. I can get more of the definition and the clarity of it. Mm -hmm. It's still you're not missing the sub because by turning it up, you mm -hmm. still you're, you're feeling are you, it. Are you not to beat this low end thing to death? But it's just it's, I know people have struggled with it because I know the struggles I had. People say, "Oh, I carve this. I carve that." Do you do you do any carving? I mean, is is there such a thing as carving? I, I, no. I'm trying to figure out why I missed the carvings. Class in school or something, <laughs> yeah, you know. It's like I didn't catch that one either. Is you just listen to it, and if it's in the way, you get rid of it. If you need more of it, you add it. I find I don't over compress the bass. That's what I don't do. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of like to let it sit, and I use the compression more for just controlling it. And you know, I know a lot of people do tricky stuff with uh, compression and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, really tricky. But mm -hmm. I just kind of I'm using it more for a control factor of you know, where I have it, because it's not hard for me to get the low end. For some reason, it just comes so naturally. Mm -hmm. It's actually more, I have, to, I have to work harder to get the clarity and, and to get, you know, the, the mids just right and to get everything mm -hmm. to pop out of the speakers the way mm -hmm. I want than I do to get the low end right. The low end just kind of comes, and now and then you got one thing that gets stuck on during a mix, it always seems, right? Yeah, you always have oh, one always, little always, problem always, that you're always, always, and, and always you keep going back to that same thing all the time just to get mm -hmm. it just right. Sometimes, you know, that's the base, but, yeah. you know, you, you work through those types of things. And that one problem never rears its head until four in the morning. But uh, I really do like the fact of, of filtering out stuff that you don't need, though, and actually turning up things. Mm -hmm. You know, I like the volume effect more than 
anything, even on, on vocals or on high end or anything. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people will mis, misquote themselves and they'll ask me, the, can you make this cut through a little more? If I really know that producer knows what he's saying exactly, I'll reach for a little high mids or whatever to make it cut a little more. But most of the time, I think they just ask for it to be a little louder. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I just, I'll say, watch this and I'll turn it up a couple dB and a, yeah, just like that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, yeah, because you know, you don't want to over EQ everything. You want the whole essence of the signal to be there, mm -hmm. not just certain parts that you're trying to bring out. True. You know what I mean? And that's True. not, to me, what makes it cut through. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a fine line there. Um, in hip hop, we, we work, um, we manipulate the stereo field a little differently than a lot of other people uh, in that genre. But um, how, how, what's your approach towards mono and hip hop? I, I, I tend to like hip hop being a little more mono than stereo, and I like a couple of things kind of wide, but I'll, I'll keep my backgrounds kind of in a little bit. Yeah, you're not kidding. I do too. I don't go for the real wide, spread no, out all the way, no, left no. and right. No. I, I, I do bring them in. And like with loops and things too, mm -hmm. I, I tend, if I, if I bring those in a little more towards the middle and leave it in mono, mm -hmm. it hits so much harder. Yeah. It's got so much more punch and so much more impact. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times on a hip hop song especially, that's what you're going for more than you're going for like an audio file spread kind of, you know, uh, stereo spectrum mm -hmm. or something, you know. Uh, I, I, think it, I think mono, the, the use of doing things in mono is really helpful yeah. when you're, when you're yeah. trying to get that. You know, I, in fact, even just doing like even a lot of people print their kicks in stereo, print their kicks in, I mean, their snares in stereo, mm -hmm. their I, bass. I, I, that's a trend. I'm getting like that. every I, single tr every Everybody. Single. And I don't quite go for that sometimes, you know, like yeah. when I print my kicks, I print them mono. Mm -hmm. Unless they have stereo information on the top that I want to come out. Mm -hmm. But otherwise... I'm mono and that out. I want it to be mm -hmm. smacking, and I Base just too. as soon as you bring them in, mm -hmm. it starts to hit harder. What I do on the, on a lot of the, uh, especially on a lot of the dance basses, I'll I'll, uh, I'll duplicate the track. I'll roll everything off on the bottom mm -hmm. end, and then keep the top end spread, the and, top and, end and spread the bottom end mono. You're still getting all of that info. Yeah. But then bring up the mono track underneath it to give exactly. that extra. Exactly. I do that, that with effect. kicks yeah, too. Yeah, that's a great approach. Um, That's the really the move. Because today's dance music does have a lot of stereo bass sounds. Yeah. You, you can't really mono that out. Mm -hmm. you know? Not the top end. Not the top end. The of bottom it. is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, a, for heaven's sakes, you're sitting there with a sub in your studio and it's mono. And it's like, yeah. that ought to tell you something right there. Yeah. Man, you know, one of the things I'm, 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 I'm proud of you is you've always had a good, strong um, educational component as part of your career. Are you still pretty involved? In Very involved, yeah. I like showing people. I always have interns, and I'm showing people uh, things. I'm, You're doing a seminar in I January. Am. I got a seminar coming up on the 14th and 15th that I'm going to do at my studio. And uh, it's like a two-day production seminar. You come in, we do a song from the beginning, and I, then the second day, I'll mix it. And, you know, there's a lot of participation, a lot of learning in there, and uh, people really seem to come off with that. I can uh, imagine. Come out of that with a lot of info. If, if I were I've done to it for years at um, university uh, at, at middle, middle Tennessee State. <laughs> what is wrong with you, Hurst? <laughs> is she pregnant, or does she need like? Yeah. <laughs> but they've been loving it at the university for years, so I yeah. would just do it at, uh, at my studio on my own. I think it's going to be yeah, it's going to be big. Kids love it, and you get a lot of enthusiasts, a lot of hobbyists, a lot of people who want to be pros. A lot of if I were to come take the course, would I get a discount? Of course. Oh, good. Yeah, I let you. Yeah, yeah. Will you will you uh, give us a call like a, a a few days before where you can still get tickets and we can mention it? Because I'm, I'm telling sure you guys, you'll. Uh, you'll, you'll learn a lot from Dave. He's uh, he's inventive. He's uh, uh, knows how to share. He knows how to teach. He's got information, and he, he has a gift for imparting that to other people. Uh, How about the front of the house stuff? Yeah, let's go into that. Mm. How uh, I, I I did a lot of live sound when, before I started engineering, and I, I know it helped me with terminology and just signal flow and. 
And troubleshooting. Tuning. Plus, you got you got to tune the room every day that you're in, you exactly. know. <laughs> yeah. And then being mostly, I was doing the opening act, so we didn't get access to all the good stuff. And you have you figure out ways to make your band loud by manipulating <laughs> the mid range and exactly and all that stuff. I'll find the uh, the last EQ in the in the in the signal path. Uh, the last thing, whatever it is, in the signal path, and, and they don't know that I know that's what it is, and I'll go to that and turn it up, yeah. and I always get my extra for there. I, uh, <laughs> I did live sound for the Grammys the year Christina and uh, everybody, uh, ping, and all did Lady Marmalade, and um, I, I made the mistake of asking one of the guys in the truck, how many people are listening to this? And, he, and I think he said like billion something, and man, I, my depends almost had to be replaced that day. It's a lot of pressure. People don't understand because when you're the opening act, you've already been sabotaged probably, and the, the the headliner does their sound check after you, so everything has been reset. Yeah, they strike your board. They, yeah, your after board. After you just goes, did all that, it's just now yeah. struck. And so you've got you've got two bars to get the sound. Well, that's where digital boards nowadays are helpful. Yeah, you know, I find it. You know, we we we've been using digital boards mm -hmm. a lot. You can store your things, pull it up, next show, next show. But let me ask you this. It's nice. Like one of the things that that that, that I think, if I do have something unique and about the way that I make records, I even though I'm sitting in a studio by myself listening to a couple of monitors, I still feel in some ways like I'm trying to get the audience going in a, the, like you would in a live show. Mm -hmm. Like, like do, you bring, do, do, you, do you have a lot of residual stuff from the live stuff that you bring into the mm -hmm. process of making a record? I do, I do, especially for, after doing it for so long. Mm -hmm. I find that I really, and vice versa, I do a lot of the stuff that I do in the studio to make it more like a studio experience for the audience that's there. So I definitely bring both together. But when I'm in the studio, yeah, I, I, I want to perform. I want it to sound like a concert in a way, you know, so mm -hmm. that it's a performance. And sometimes you imagine or even just actually have an audience there while I'm mixing. Mm -hmm. You know, I have people in the room just to feed off of, you know, things like that. But yeah, I, you know, the approach to a live thing is a lot different, but it makes you fast. That's one thing. It makes you be able to get a mix up fast and quick, find the problems that's, that, that is messing with you and dealing with it because you got 30,000, 40,000 people right. looking at you, you waiting solve them on the fly, on right? the fly you know? So it makes Plus you have cues and things, don't you? you have to deal yeah, with and, I, and I usually just memorize those and just go just for those. And, yeah, yeah, yeah I can usually feel those out. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, people talk about uh, additive and subtractive EQ a lot, you know? And I think, you know, when I'm doing subtractive EQ, it's more when I'm in a live situation. Because mm -hmm. there it really is trying to get the most gain out of yeah. something mm -hmm. in, yeah. you know, and place it in the mix without properly without feedback. feedback. Yeah. So, you know, you're, you're trying to find those frequencies that are sounding more like ambience and like a ring in the room and kind of just taking those down. Mm -hmm. So you but do a lot of It trains your ear, doesn't it? It does, because you can find frequencies yeah. fast. You have to. Yeah. He said like fast that. twice. You know what that makes me think of? What? What's, what's fast? Tell me. Batter's box. Oh. And that was my that was my best segue. I, I rehearsed that. <laughs> no, it I had Drew pretend like he was you. We <laughs> sat there and rehearsed that segue for about three days. I probably screwed it up. You, should, you got attend rehearsals. Yeah, exactly. You ready to do a little batter's box? Sure. All right, let's jump right into it. You're a pro. Um, are you most comfortable just telling me plugins or, or outboard gear or either one? Whatever. I, I'll start off saying I got a, I got a, a, a 56 channel SSL. And that I usually spread out everything out of the Pro Tools and run it through the SSL. Mm -hmm. So right away, I love the SSL. Everything going through that makes right. everything sound a little better. Okay. Then we can go on well, from there. If, if we get too many stuff. SSLs, give me your second choice That's then. what I'm saying. I mean, <laughs> okay. That's why I said that right off the top, so I probably won't even come back to that anymore. Okay. Yeah. Uh, lead vocals. Lead vocals is the hardest thing to actually choose one way to do everything all the time. That's the one instrument that I switch. Uh, I'll, I'll put this EQ, it just depends on the vocal itself. Mm -hmm. That one, it really does, you know? But, I mean, I, I always like a little, maybe a little H3000 on it. I still have that effect, you know, a little micro pitch shift oh, always yeah. kind of makes things spread out a little bit, you know. I don't, not too much though, you know, mm -hmm. a little eighth note delay. And as far as inserts, you know, uh, just, a, just a quality compressor and a quality EQ 
And it could be anything on lead vocal. That's probably the hardest one out of all of them. Okay. Uh, acoustic guitar. Well, there I like I like API. API I put on the insert and, and again. Or 550. 560 or 550. Uh, it depends on how much carving I want to do on it. Like with you know, as far as you know, seeing it and this and that. Okay. If I'm just doing a couple things like brightening it up, I'll, I'll use the 550. Pads. Pads. Like R&B type pads, not dance pads. I mean, nothing special. I, I use the SSLEQ, and, and 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 if I have a G series, maybe hit the the times three button, and turn the high end up a little bit to just add a lot of air to it. Okay. That, that kind of works for me sometimes. Oh, okay. Uh, Rhodes. Rhodes. There's there's so many different types of Rhodes sounds, mm -hmm. so you got to treat each one a little different. You get that warm, like a D'Angelo rose. You know or? that really warm kind of like rubbery kind of mm -hmm. sound out of the out of the roads. That's a beautiful sound, and mm -hmm. and you'll you know a lot of times I'll just take the high end and high mids right on out of that and boost it up, mm -hmm. give it a little 250 warmth, you know, a little mm -hmm. somewhere around there, a little 160 warmth, you know, and kind of go with that. It's a little tricky, but then you got those other kind of roads where you got that crappy kind of low end where you have to take oh, out yeah. some kind of 800 or 600 or 500 yeah. it's got that and low mid always thing. Have chorus on them too. yeah yeah and you got to pull that out and then maybe even turn up the highs in it to get the uh a little more clarity out of it but i love to i love to put like a tremolo or something on there oh yeah you okay. know just a little tremolo to make it kind of go back and forth and you know that always sounds real cool so stereo kind of thing um electric guitars electric uh, API, API, SSL EQ. Program kick, samples. Kicks? Oh, Pultec, 160X to a Pultec. Oh, I love yeah. those. Hard to beat the 160X. The 160X is, is it. Uh, it's on a snare tube. 160X, and then I'll put it, not maybe, maybe if I want a warmer sound, I'll put it to a pull tech. Go ahead and add the snare. We'll, we'll With the there. snare I want it, I, I, I might use an API if I'm gonna use an outboard, yeah. you know? I like those, it's snappy, you know? It's got a nice snap to I it. I keep thinking that one of these days I'm gonna change, but I still keep coming back to that, that API uh, 160 combination, even though now I'm trying to well, maybe that's where I got it from, man. I, you know, like, you I'm know. not sure if I was doing it back then. <laughs> I think I only, I think I discovered the 160 after we were working together. Maybe you I know, got I worked from with you. Keith. Keith got one a lot too, and he he used to use Keith, uh, yeah. he used to use that combination a lot, and I would just find it. Uh, it just works. It works. Stereo bus. Mm, I don't do too much stereo bus compression. I like the the middle SSL middle compressor if I use it a lot. I'm experiment with it though. Yeah. I just go up and down with it and see kind of more again for control factor. I'm not really trying to get my loudness from there. Okay. I, you know, I, I'm trying to just control what I have going on. And lastly, um, unless I'm in the box and then, you know, some kind of L1, L1s or whatever. But I'm not a big stereo compressor guy, though. I'll tell you the truth. Gotcha. Um, and lastly, uh, synth bass. Synth bass again, a pull tech is hard to beat, and I like a LA. 2A because it, it, it's got a little slowness to it and I like that. If I need a, something that's faster, then I'll use an 1176, you okay. know. But I love 1176s. I love to use the real ones, but I love the plugins too. Because the plugins, you know how everybody says to buy each box sounds different. Oh, that's really. But at the same time, if I got a set of toms and I want to put 1176s on them, I want, kind of want them all to sound the same. I don't want each box to sound a little different. Yeah. So I like the plugins for something like that. You know, like some mm -hmm. of those older Neves and things too. Some of the plugins on some of those things are actually better because they don't have the glitches and the noise. <laughs> and the, I know that if I turn it, it's going to be right. You know, so yeah. sometimes it's a little bit better for me. You know. Yeah. But um, again, with 1176, those are tricky because. When you compress, a lot of people don't really talk about the noise that it brings up, too. You get a tremendous a amount of noise. noise, floor, and noise, and the headphone bleed, and all kinds of ambience and everything, the room sounds and all that. And you've really got to take that in consideration mm -hmm. when you're doing hard compression. I've got the Good last point. batter's box question, okay. which is, you'll get us the information to the seminar so we can let everybody know. I certainly will. You'll come back. For sure. You have a I good time? Wait. I had a great time. Man. Thanks for having me. Uh, what a, what a pleasure. Let's, let's, let's just...
have you back in a few months and let's just do a whole show on bass. Let's do it. I mean, It'd be great. Dave, I love you, man. Thanks, Thanks for coming by. No, of Appreciate you having me out here. Wrap them up, Mr. Pensado. Well, it's the holiday season, Herbert. Yeah. Um, Listen, let's thank our, our, our audience for, you know, you guys have given us a great Christmas gift in this. Um, can't say enough about your support. So many things are happening. We are hoping to come back with some real new and aggressive things in ne next year, and it's all because of your support around the globe. We're, what a Christmas gift to give to us, um, and what a Christmas gift you deserve, sir. In oh, terms of man. The I, I, feel, I feel in my heart just like you do. You guys are the best audience in the world, and I really feel like like you and us, we're, we're creating something special that, although it existed before, it, it, the camaraderie and, the, and the, the, the little thing we got going on here is, uh, is something that we, we should all be proud of. You know, it's not just us, it's our audience. And, and big shout out to Drew for all the help he gives us. Absolutely. Big shout out to Will Thompson, who yeah. we could not do this without. And um, listen, um, we're going to take a breather, and then we're going to come back bigger, better, faster, sleeker, leaner. So congratulations to you. Yeah, you too, Happy right. holidays, All and right. say goodbye to our folks. Okay, guys, uh, before I get teary-eyed, we'll see you next year. Absolutely. Mm -hmm.